Hello. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> I, I walk and talk slow, but I actually can run kind of fast. <laughs> um, so this is pretty exciting for me. Um, and we can talk about sort of our lab and what we've been working on. It's a little bit in its infancy, but it's been pretty exciting. And I'm going to share with you the ideas uh, that we're talking about. Some of it actually may uh, sort of stoke some images from our M&M &M this morning, actually. Um, and it'll be something to think about. You may see some crossovers, and, and it might get you at least a little intellectually curious. So I'll talk about implications of the inflammation coagulation axis in severe acute trauma. So trauma, as we know, is, uh, has mortality that is multimodal in nature. This was described um, uh, previously. And, uh, and, and what we see typically in trauma is that early deaths tend to occur due to bleeding or traumatic brain injury. And those deaths often tend to occur within the first two to four hours. Um, however, there's a subsequent period of death, uh, which accounts for anywhere between 10 and 20 percent of mortality that we see in trauma. And uh, it tends to show up, manifest approximately a week or two after. Um, anyone who's done trauma has seen cases where you will, you know, go into a, a case that seems like a disaster. You'll put everything together. You'll be technically proficient, surprise yourself even, and then do this miraculous operation only to be heartbroken about a week or two later um, as the patient slowly begins to deteriorate and it seems like you can do very little to stop that train. And so this, you know, spurs questions, you know, like, how can we get that better? Like, when we have a situation where we've done all that we can to restore the physiology, to stop the hemorrhage, and to contain the contamination, and, and then we still have this outcome, what is holding us back? In fact, in trauma, the physiologic insult is so great that patients who undergo severe trauma are often never the same there are some real significant changes. And, and this even spurs the curiosity further. This is actually a, a diagram from some research by one of our colleagues from Travis Air Force Base, Dr. Ian Stewart. He's a nephrologist, a combat nephrologist, uh, he likes to call himself. So um, what this basically shows is that patients who undergo a severe acute trauma, traumatic event will often, years later, have a higher tendency to develop diabetes, chronic kidney disease, hypertension, uh, you know, they have risk factors for chronic disease. And so there's something about the patients that happens probably very early on uh, that is uh, completely altering and changes uh, the patient altogether. So my question was, at what point do these inciting events actually occur? Are the deaths that we see in that later uh, mode of mortality coming because of uh, decisions made um, in, the, in the hospital course after the initial uh, intervention, or is it something that happens early on? Well, I propose that, in fact, there are changes that probably happen ex very early on, within the first few hours of trauma. Um, this concept is not invented by me, obviously. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Cowley was a military surgeon who actually ended up uh, as director of the University of Maryland Shock Trauma Center. And he famously stated, there's a golden hour between life and death. If you're critically injured, you have less than 60 minutes to survive. You might not die right then. It may be three days or two weeks later, but something's happened in your body that is irreparable. And so that was sort of our premise. Now, this concept of the golden hour has not been established on a scientific basis. We can't say what it is um, that it is that's changed, per se. Um, however, clinically, this concept has been validated and is actually the basis for the design of many trauma systems, including the one used by the military, the Tactical Combat Casualty Care. And this is a depiction of kind of what happens. So we all understand that uh, early intervention is best and actually affects long-term outcomes. Whereas late intervention, even if you are able to successfully restore physiology and stop hemorrhage and contain contamination, um, you still have worse outcomes. 
This is actually a demonstration. Sorry. So a mandate was put out by the Department of Defense to uh, make it necessary that patients uh, were evacuated within, in a timely manner, within 60 minutes. And this mandate came out 2009. And upon the issuance of that, the casualty rate or the mortality rate for casualties actually uh, substantially decreased. Now, it was getting better to start with. There was a, a predicted linear improvement, but the actual improvement, the slope changed to be even more dramatic once the uh, evacuation times uh, increased. So what's behind all of that? I guess that would be the next question. Well, to look at what's happening in the setting of trauma is an extremely complex question. There's a lot going on. You're integrating numerous mechanisms. This is by no means an exhaustive list. It's more like categories, and even within these categories, there are subcategories of different types of injuries that are all coming together. Now, that is very hard to study, so you have to break it up into pieces. Well, my background is one of immunology, and uh, my interest has always been uh, sort of the interaction between innate and adaptive immuno immun immunity. And so uh, that kind of was where I chose to focus. I think everybody has to have one area that they can solve the piece, and then by bringing it all together, um, we can sort of get a bigger picture and solve some of the big problems. So just sort of in breaking this down, I just wanted to start with the inflammation coagulation axis. So when a body is injured, it has a couple of, 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 of demands that it has to address pretty much right away. One is bleeding and one is infection. And it turns out that the body is smart. So it has recognized for as long as there's been life and vascular systems that if the vascular system is damaged by a traumatic event, there is likely a violation um, that has included something that has pathogens on it. So it has decided to sort of combine the two tasks in one. And it, uh, it recognizes that if you have a system that can stop hemorrhage, you might as well also use that same system to deal with infection because the two go together. So while we look at inflammation and coagulation separately for understanding, because you know everybody had to memorize that chart um, and it's complex, there's actually so much crosstalk that you can't think of the two in a vacuum, except for simplicity's sake. Um, so this is a schematic from a review here in which we see kind of some of that overlap. It's a little bit complex, but what we have is a polymorphonuclear nucleoside there. This is just a, a neutrophil. And the neutrophil, when it sees the patterns associated with uh, bacterial infection, uh, it recognizes those motifs as uh, signals, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And in response to that, actually, it does a few things. One is the traditional killing response that everybody learned back in, uh, in early med school, where they make some hydrogen peroxide. But it actually has an even more ancient and uh, sort of insidious trick that it does. It, it kicks out its DNA and forms a net with the DNA. DNA is charged. It has a lot of negative charges on it. And so it becomes very, very sticky. Anybody who's ever worked with pipettes with DNA knows that it kind of is a little bit messy. And it, it turns out that it, it binds to bacteria. And the histones and the, and the DNA can bind to that. And the system that we have, our innate system, recognizes that when it sees DNA that's not in a cell, and it sees those proteins in the wrong context, that's a problem. That means that that was done intentionally. There's like cell death, and it's like, it's targeting that. So then you'll have all these other cells that are sort of the surveillance guys, like the monocytes here. And they'll actually pick up on that DNA and those bacterial signals, and they'll go forth and, and spread the word and mobilize the immune response. Well, one of the other things that they do actually, and this is kind of where the tie-in is, is when these cells activate, they actually express tissue factor. Now, you guys all remember tissue factor from the coagulation pathway, but you probably didn't learn it in the immunology class as much. So tissue factor, uh, we'll get into, is, is basically one of the nidus for the extrinsic pathway of coagulation. And 
what ends up happening is this tissue factor gets mobilized and fibrin gets picked up and the fibrin and the tissue factor can also be used for signaling to incite an innate immune response. And indeed, just to validate, I guess this slide's a little bit out of place, but you'll see actually both in humans and in mice, what happens in some of our most profound infections is that you'll have a thrombocytosis that occurs and you'll have sort of a uh, recruitment of these monocytes that'll go around and, and start to take care of the business. Um, this is actually from a cecal ligation and puncture model, uh, which is a mouse model in which you take the cecum, which is a little bit redundant, kind of like an appendix in us, and you can tie it off and put a hole in it, and it causes intra-abdominal catastrophe, as you might imagine. And in fact, when you look at those animals, what you'll see is that Initially, their platelet counts drop, but then they shoot sky high until the infection gets walled off. If they're going to survive, you'll see this response every time. And the, similarly, the monocyte levels will just sort of steadily go up. Now, where does the tissue factor fit into all that? Just kind of to refresh uh, what it is, actually. So it combines with factor 7A and uh, acts to catalyze conversion with factor 10 into its active form. Uh, which is uh, 10A. Additionally, it has another lesser understood function in that it can uh, stimulate intracellular signaling in cells that express it, like monocytes. It's a little bit less important, but I just want you to understand that sometimes the system is a little bit more complicated than we are aware of, and this is all kind of new. So tissue factor itself has an intracellular domain, which does not by itself signal, but what it does is it clusters all its friends these other proteases which activate the G protein uh, signaling cascade and can activate cells like the uh, monocytes. Okay, and so then you end up uh, basically getting those uh, monocytes sort of like, you know, they become activated and they get ready to, ready to work. And what we actually see is that in the setting of injury, there is this tissue factor mobilization. Uh, as you recall, there's two sources. So there's the traditional source that we all remember. So there's tissue factor lining the basement membranes of our vasculature. So when that integrity is lost, that tissue factor gets exposed, and that sort of catalyzes your extrinsic pathway. But additionally, as I mentioned, there's this monocyte upregulation. And this step occurs very early on in injury. This is a study actually by uh, our group here. This is uh, Dr. Utter's work from back in 2001. This is actually a human trial. And they were looking at trauma patients with and without head injury, which will become important a little bit later. But what you notice is that in patients, we'll start with the open circles because that's the most relevant group for us for right now. I keep pressing that wrong button. So in patients who uh, undergo severe trauma, what ends up happening is that they're blood circulating levels of monocytes that express tissue factor has uh, increased markedly. So you'll see here, this is a control uninjured uh, victim who volunteered for the blood draw probably. And then uh, as opposed to our patients who uh, came in with trauma, who have a markedly increased uh, expression of tissue factor on their monocytes, showing that the, the monocytes that are circulating are now active and ready to rock and roll. Now, interestingly, and we'll come back to this, patients with uh, head injury, they'll have an initial uh, mobilization, but it actually gets attenuated very quickly. Um, and that's, that's a very curious thing, and we'll touch on that in a second. Uh, likewise, not only do those uh, monocytes uh, upregulate tissue factor, but they also can form uh, these complexes with platelets. So you have these circulating monocyte complex platelets. Uh, monocyte platelet complexes that are circulating here, and they get sort of mobilized right very early on uh, in the injury, and they, they stick around for a while. This study was carried out to 72 hours, and we still haven't seen that number return to baseline, so they're hanging out. And the, the association of the complexes uh, is somewhat dependent on the tissue factor, but not completely. So these complexes form regardless. It, things just get a little bit. There's a lot of, of adhesion and co-stimulation that is occurring. And that's just basically what we're talking about here. So with these circulating complexes of platelets and little coagulation uh, nidises, 
going around, uh, what role do those play actually in injury? So we hypothesized that the tissue factor mobilization in the setting of shock actually may lead to microvascular thrombosis. So you can see that you have these complexes circulating around that are capable of, of causing this kind of clots, basically. And they have the potential to sort of form thrombosis uh, wherever they decide to deposit, right? And then just a little schematic to sort of demonstrate that. So we'd have an injury. The injury causes this activation. We have these circulating complexes. And then when they get sort of jammed up, you might expect that to happen in the microvasculature for various reasons. And then you get a parenchymal injury. Now, the transplant team was just talking about parenchymal injury in the setting of inflammation. It's not trauma, but inflammation has certain characteristics that are universal. And so this concept could be actually fairly widely applicable. And it makes us curious, especially when we see other things like real world problems that are causing us to be a little bit curious as to how to investigate them. So we wanted to develop a model. So we needed a few things to ask the right questions. We needed tools that were useful. And we started with a murine model, so mouse. Why mouse? Mouse is useful for several reasons. One, you can get a whole bunch of them. So you, for statistics, you can like really examine like how uh, effective the question is. And they're easy to work with. Um, and, and so it, it facilitates you to have a good study power. Second, the mouse is very well characterized, especially from an immunologic perspective. There's plenty of genetic manipulation that already exists and it allows you down the road to uh, study um, effectively by, by removing certain molecules that you think are implicated in your pathways that you're curious about. And so it's a very useful tool. We had to create the trauma. So we needed an injury that was reproducible, easy to generate, and had just the right about of mortality or morbidity. Uh, we decided to go with a pulmonary contusion. Um, it's nice because one of the things that we're curious about is how this tissue factor gets mobilized and what actually drives it. And we believe that there are probably going to be some quantitative and qualitative aspects to that. Um, lung is probably not the same as liver injury. Things are different, but we have to start somewhere. So lung is, is a reasonable place as any. And then quantitatively, we can sort of alter the amount of uh, force that we use to generate the pulmonary injury, creating a small injury or a large injury that's reproducible and allows us to study that mobilization. So our model has two components to it. So when we were designing this model, we wanted to mimic shock in controllable and modulatable ways. And so what we did was uh, we have the injury component but that pulmonary contusion itself doesn't bleed. But all of our severe trauma patients, they bleed. And so we wanted to be able to add that in or add that out. And so what we use as a surrogate, we use phlebotomy, but we're able to take out approximately 15% of the blood volume and get sort of a class, almost like a class two uh, <laughs> level of shock for our mice. So the question was, are we able to generate this microvascular thrombosis? And then within that question, there are several sub-questions in the model development. One, we have to see, are we able to cause the tissue factor mobilization part first, and then are we subsequently able to get the clot formation second? Um, and so we set out to do that, and we were going to look for the tissue factor mobilization uh, by flow cytometry. Flow cytometry, if you're not familiar with it, it's a tool that allows us to sort individual cells and look at the molecules that they express either on their surface or sometimes we can actually look at molecules that are intracellular as well through other techniques. Um, but what we were looking for specifically is, is something akin to the previous study. So we want to identify the, the uh, monocytes, which we use the marker CD14. Uh, we want to identify the platelets so that we could show that uh, those complexes forming, and we wanted to be able to look at the tissue factor um, so that we could determine if those monocytes were in fact upregulating their expression. That is a work that is still in progress, um, but we're pretty excited about it, and that's about all I can say about that. 
Um, additionally, we wanted to look uh, for the cloud itself, and so what we were using was uh, histology and, and, and immunohistochemistry. So basically, we make slides, and we look and see, is there actually clot in the microvasculature in various organs? So we look at the liver, the kidneys, the lungs, for example, and we look at small intestine. So what did we see? This is histology. And lo and behold, this is uh, two different situations. One is an uninjured uh, mouse that was simply put to sleep and then subsequently um, it was sacrificed and then we took, in this case, this is a slide from kidney. And this is what it looks like. So we, we, after we sacrifice the animals, we perfuse them with a fixative, get rid of all the extra blood, and then what's left is just if there's any clot, we see it. Um, and so you see in this control animal, uh, this is some vasculature and this is, you know, tubules and things. And, and we, we had a hard time. We didn't find very much clot in our control animals, which was good. That's a good thing. Um, however, in the mice that had the injury and the hemorrhage, um, you know, we were looking around and, and lo and behold, there it was. So this pink is consistent with fibrin deposition uh, in the H&E staining. So we were pretty happy about that. And then just to sort of further validate that, uh, one of our early slides is, is one of uh, immunohistochemistry. So these are the same conditions. However, in this case, we stain using an antibody that actually binds to fibrin so that we could more definitively say, yeah, that's actual clot. And uh, what's, what's, what's neat, so you see here a little glomerulus there. And, uh, and in fact, that glomerulus is all clotted off. And we, we see some of these things. Now, one of the things that was really interesting, and it's kind of an interesting phenomenon in science, is that you know, nothing ever works the first time you try it, right? So you're like pulling out your hair and things. And so one of the things that we were doing was uh, in our early development, we hadn't included the hemorrhage component in some of the, in some of the mice. And, and poor Jim was over there, Jim Becker there, I can point to him with the laser one, was sort of pulling out his hair, looking for the clots, and he's just calling me up and he said, you know, I, I just can't find it. Um, and so then I was like, well, you know, let's add in the hemorrhage component. And there it was, right? And that was very curious. So we asked ourselves, and we still have to validate some of this with numbers, but, but we did ask ourselves, we began to ask ourselves, we got excited about it. It was the, the opportunity and the crisis after we couldn't find the clot first. So we asked ourselves, when we have the injury and the hemorrhage together, we see the clot, we see the microvascular thrombosis, but when we have the injury alone, we don't see it. What are the implications of this? So we anticipate with the injury itself, we should see the mobilization of the tissue factor, and we should have the complexes floating around, and we're working diligently to get the flow cytometry data to back that assumption up. We don't have it yet, but we think that that is true. That being said, how can you have these circulating complexes and not have the clot? So we were thinking maybe there's and is it an active or a passive deposition process? Like, what makes the actual complexes sit down and, and block off uh, the vasculature? The, the passive concept would be basically as the, uh, that the complexes would sort of accumulate in the places where it was most convenient, so like small caliber vessels with low flow and no shear force to push them through. Whereas the active idea would be that there's actually a receptor that's causing adhesion and recruitment of those monocyte complexes causing binding. And so just to go through that, like, so what would make something, what, what would make the passive idea work? Well, you know, if we have hemorrhage, that's going to change the flow dynamics to some extent. It's going to change the intravascular volume. It's actually going to change the viscosity. Um, of, the, of the serum, as I'm sure you've all heard Dr. Holcroft talk about shock and, and how viscosity changes. And it's going to change vascular tone as well. The entire cardiovascular system is, is dynamic. The blood, the vessels, and the pump, they all can change in, in, to adapt to, to shock. Um, and so this would be the idea that, that things got stuck, whereas active would require an upregulation, a molecule, something that, that comes up. It might even require recruitment. So there are molecules that we know that do this. So there are selectins and ICAMs. Um, I won't bore you too much with the acronyms, but let's just say there are receptors that combine these. And uh, 
when you consider these two possibilities, you would think that the two possibilities actually would have a different potential treatment uh, pattern, right? So for passive clot, to prevent the clot accumulation, you'd simply have to restore the hemodynamics to normal, right? So just basically fluid resuscitation, kind of like what we do right now. Um, however, if there's an active binding process, there's a lot less that you can do with just fluid, right? You'd have to actually molecularly inhibit that cell interaction, right? And to some extent, maybe heparin wouldn't work, right? And so just to talk about it, so we all are familiar with the way that leukocytes tend to bind to those molecules, and maybe the same is true for these complexes because the monocytes, in fact, are capable of expressing the same uh, receptors that we see in neutrophils that are used to slow them down, which would be the selectins, uh, to allow them to stick stably, which would be the ICAMs, and then to subsequently diapodese or travel outside of the vasculature into the space. So we wanted to start with this concept that the possible that this was active binding and not a passive thing, because this if this was true it could be somewhat actually I don't know is, is it bold of me to say revolutionary but uh, it would be cool it would just be interesting. Um, <laughs> so we hypothesize, but but by generating a hypothesis it allows you to give a testicle question so you can design your experiment to actually come up with an outcome and, and decide you know what's actually happening. So we said, okay, well, maybe this microvascular thrombosis requires tissue factor mobilization as like a first step, but then actually requires an active recruitment of the monocytes and the clot forming units in the microvasculature. So, how do we test that? Well, what we're setting up now, and this is all in progress, is a large experiment with four different conditions. And we'll talk through them. So one would be our poor control mouse who was just minding their own business and got sacrificed. And then we looked and saw what we saw. We would expect in that mouse that there's no injury, so we wouldn't have tissue factor mobilization. There is no hemorrhagic shock, so we wouldn't have, uh, expect uh, adhesion molecule upregulation. And, there, and therefore, without those two parts, we would expect no microvascular thrombosis. Now, I'm going to caution you here because, to some extent, you never want to make assumptions about what the answer should be and think that if you don't get the answer that you thought you got, it's wrong. Because, actually, that's where the opportunity for the most learning is. It's when you get the unexpected result. It's when you don't get the microvascular clot and the injury only and you're looking for it and you're scratching your head that you have the opportunity to make the leap. Um, that being said, we'll go back to our conditions. Uh, next, we would have the, in sorry, the injury alone mouse. So just the pulmonary contusion alone. And we would expect that with that, we would get tissue factor mobilization. However, uh, we perhaps don't have that second active binding part that happens. So we don't get the upregulation of the receptors. And therefore, we would see in the flow cytometry that we would have these complexes going around that have upregulated, where we have monocytes that have upregulated their tissue factor, but yet nothing in the end organs. <coughs> so no microvascular thrombosis. Next, we would have the hemorrhagic shock component. Um, and what we would expect there is no tissue factor mobilization because there's no injury. However, maybe this is what drives the cell adhesion uh, the cell, the adhesion molecule upregulation. So, but without the two parts, uh, no microvascular thrombosis. Now, if Sarah Ashley's here, some of her preliminary data suggests actually in a pig model, which is very interesting, that hemorrhage alone can cause increases in tumor necrosis factor alpha levels, which actually has been shown in the lab to drive up the expression of these same adhesion molecules. So we'd have to validate something like that in a mouse. Now that's like fishing. We, we're going to start a little bit more focused on that, but, but it is pretty uh, exciting as a concept, right? And um, then finally, we have injury and hemorrhagic shock and see the microvascular thrombosis because we have all the parts. <laughs> 
So what are we going to be looking for? Well, we're going to set up that experiment. We're going to see what we see. We're going to do it. He's, uh, immunohistochemistry. We're going to look for some of the known culprits, some of the adhesion molecules that we know, some of the chemokines that we know. And then should we find those, we can do blocking uh, antibodies. However, it may be a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and I'm going to get back to that because I think one of my slides is out of order here. But the other thing that we want to do is, so if we actually have upregulation of, of receptors uh, in the microvasculature, there has to be something that drives that. And presumably, if it's something that we can find in serum, that would be really interesting. Uh, why? Um, because, one, it would, it would allow us something that we can find and that we could test for prediction purposes. So what we would look for in a soluble mediator is something in the serum that would actually drive up this uh, upregulation. And we would expect to see it in the mice that have hemorrhage um, with or without the injury. So we would expect to see that mediator there. Uh, and then, however, looking for a single molecule in an immune response is sometimes a little bit complicated. Our bodies are basically designed to fight pathogens over millennia, and uh, we don't want to get wiped out by any one, so we've got this built-in redundancy. So it's often more than just one signaling pathway that has to be overcome. So perhaps it's not uh, a single molecule that we're looking for, but it's more of a, of a profile that we're actually looking for in concept. And so basically we would look for cytokines, some of the usual suspects that we already know are involved in uh, upregulating these molecules like tumor necrosis factor and IL-1 by ELISA. Um, and additionally, uh, we would consider a proteomic approach as well, ultimately, so that we could uh, understand this uh, profile if one exists. That way we wouldn't be missing it by, force, you know, by face, focusing on just one molecule. And if we find that, then the next experiment is then to try to block that and see if we can block the formation. Of the, of the complexes in the deposition of the clot. So antibodies, blocking experiments. Now, why is this cool? One, if we can identify a profile, it allows us to predict when we're in our surgical critical care mode, um, which patients are going to be that 7 to 20 percent that we're going to have to worry about and how we can intervene on them earlier. Um, two, not only can we predict it with a lab draw potentially, but we could identify something that we could intervene on molecularly as well, something that we could block. So that would be pretty exciting. Now, that's kind of getting ahead of ourselves, but you got to dream big to get there, right? So that's sort of where we are there. And then so this is just basically a schematic sort of just to describe what we're talking about. So it seems that we have at least preliminarily some small amount of evidence that suggests a sort of a two-step pathway where we have an injury with mobilization of monocytes and activation, tissue factor upregulation, and then when we combine that with a shock condition, we can get some parenchymal inflammation. Now, mind you, all this is still very preliminary. There's a lot of validation that still has to occur. However, um, we take the little successes. We use it to build enthusiasm and go forward. So what's coming? Well, another thing that we're interested in is in the evolution of the clot. Basically, what is the time course over which uh, it develops. Now, this has some implications to some of the questions we are asking early. So you would expect if there is an upregulation step that is necessary, the clot won't build in a linear fashion. It will actually build more like this. So the dynamics of the clot deposition is actually pretty important in predicting basically what is going on. And so we are doing some time course experiments uh, when we get more manpower basically to sort of describe which curve we are looking at this one or this one. And it also has some treatment implications, too. This is a real phenomenon, and it tells us at what point we can successfully intervene and how we can do it, right? Because obviously uh, this curve means that we have to intervene a lot earlier to undo damage, whereas if we have some time with uh, molecular upregulation, we may be able to have a little bit of a window. And then another um, concept that we need to figure out is sort of when we're treating it, if the clot's already formed, what is the mechanism by which it resolves? Is getting rid of the clot in and of itself enough to start the healing, or does there, is there more of an immunologic off switch? Um, so if we can just dissolve the clot, that would be great. But a lot of times, what we know a lot of times with chronic inflammation in some of our trauma patients, it, the 
So the inflammation is actually maintained. There's evidence to suggest more recently now that inflammation on a chronic level actually requires some off switch. And there's some, um, there's some, uh, there, well, there's just a little, little, bit, little bit of data basically to support that. But that's all pretty new. And then we want to understand basically how the body itself is able to protect against this phenomenon. So this doesn't, you know, is, are there mechanisms of, to turn this phenomenon off? Um, and sort of teleologically, we found that most of the processes that we have in the body tend to have an off switch. Is there evidence for an off switch here? Well, going back to that original slide, we saw that patients with head injury are able to attenuate that tissue factor mobilization. So there is an off switch. There is a way to get the monocytes to actually downregulate their tissue factor expression. What drives that is unknown, but it's curious. And should this be uh, a major contribution to uh, injury, that might be something that we would investigate is how the body actually does it so that we could take advantage of it and do it sort of the same way in a therapeutic manner. Additionally, many of you have seen in trauma that when patients come in and they have big major injuries and they're hypoperfused with base deficits, something happens. They basically don't clot. Well, that would be exactly the situation that we're talking about. So they get fibrinolysis when they're not perfusing. And I'm not, nobody knows why that is, but it is curious that it happens and could be teleologically an explanation for the coagulopathy of trauma. So just to show that, just to revisit that, uh, this is essentially from that same figure with tissue factor mobilization uh, by Dr. Utter. And it shows that basically those complexes um, stop forming basically in patients with head injury very quickly. They stop having the platelet associations with the monocytes. Um, additionally, so this is just a schematic depicting acute traumatic coagulopathy, in which case you have an elevated uh, hyperfibrinolysis uh, in the setting of elevated base deficits when you have a shocky condition that's pushed a little bit more extreme. In fact, our colleagues at San Francisco General Hospital published some data that show essentially that uh, when you have a profound base deficit and a severe injury, what ends up happening is the, you know, your markers for coagulation, your INR and PTT actually show uh, decreased function, even though the proteins that you have are actually still present and capable of generating the clot. And uh, my lettering is a little bit. Here. But basically, so in this uh, form here, you'll see basically this is the most important one. The factor seven levels and their activation is, is essentially the same, but the uh, PTT and INR are actually uh, significantly elevated in, in trauma. So, so in summary, uh, we hypothesize that microvascular thrombosis is a significant problem and it could potentially contribute to in-organ failure. Um, what I didn't go into here is that because fibrin and clot themselves actually recruit members of the innate immune system, they actually can cause neutrophils to further hone in and, and destroy the area, the parenchyma that you're talking about. Um, sort of one of the concepts that I was thinking about uh, when we had our M&M is people will often see the clot in the face of rejection, for example, and it's not clear if the clot drove the, reje the rejection or the rejection drove the clot. It's, there's a correlation, but you don't necessarily know what is the inciting factor. And it could be uh, either way. It could be both, and both probably can uh, work together to make sort of a snowball effect that gives you that. So blocking the clot formation may still have, have a significant role. Um, we think, and we want to investigate this being an active multi-step process, uh, one with monocyte and tissue factor mobilization, and then one with subsequent uh, activation and expression of, of adhesion molecules, and then this would be leading up to uh, parenchymal injury uh, as a result of that uh, adjacent uh, inflammation in the vasculature. Um, Side of the injury, very complex. Um, trauma has traditionally been a surgical problem and will remain so. However, um, our understanding of things happening at the molecular level will begin to shift the way things get treated and will ultimately, hopefully, improve our outcomes.
Uh, next, uh, I can't stress enough, so having been a grad student for a while, I know that they think about things, we think about things a certain way, um, which is a very focused approach and, and sort of work out from that. Um, when you're sort of in the middle of things and you're actually treating patients and you see kind of the broad picture first and then you take it back to the narrow focus. And what happens when you have a translational situation is you have mindsets that are both ways coming together to focus on a problem. And by having those diverse approaches, it actually, one, gives you very interesting questions, and two, gives you really innovative solutions. And so I would encourage everybody to think about that because it's cool. Um, trauma is changing. It's not the way that we remember it. It's evolving. And so... Uh, while technical proficiency and problem solving are always going to be the cornerstone of, of uh, successful outcomes, um, this field is going to continually evolve. And, you know, things are, things are not going to be the way that you remember them from when you were a resident at some point, right? And so there's a shift to include a lot more micro with the macro, meaning now uh, going forward, it's not going to be all just about you know, technical proficiency and fluid resuscitation and slamming that in there, but we're actually going to think about some of those molecular approaches, some of those molecular interactions that we can uh, manipulate to give us better outcomes. So it's pretty exciting, as exciting as Dr. Fan. Oh. And so I would just encourage you, so when you're sitting there in m and &M, and you're listening to the problems that are being presented, the pancreas is, is dying, and we don't know why. There's a big clot in the vein, but maybe it's coming from the parenchyma and not from the big vein. Be curious about that and ask yourself why. Um, we can ask ourselves questions like, will heparin work? We can also ask ourselves questions like, if it doesn't work, why doesn't it work, and what's actually driving this, and is there a way around it, or, or basically, you know, we. But, but all that starts here when you're sitting here listening to real world problems, right? Like the problem is, is literally right there and you can either hear it and go to the next case or you can hear it and you can say, you know, and you can, you can drive some innovation based on that. So the problems are here right in front of us every day, so it's pretty exciting. And then innovation. Innovation will be critical for surgery going forward. Uh, many other specialties um, in fact, have encroached on surgery because they have accepted innovation earlier in some respects than surgery has. And so by continuing to push forward, continuing to ask the questions and be curious, it allows us to stay uh, very competitive. It, it just makes us uh, have a level of excellence that, that we need to have. And so, um, so it starts when you're first sort of in your nascent period, when you're first coming up. And so I would just say, you know, think about it now. As you get busier and busier, you have to retain the curiosity that you had when you had a little bit of time to think about it. Um, but basically, the curiosity starts here, and you don't let the work hours, you don't let the exhaustion kill you. You, you keep it in there. You keep it in there where it belongs. So I just want to thank a bunch of people here. Um, one, I just wanted to start sort of with uh, the lab group here. So. Uh, as you all know, I share a space with Dr. Farmer, who has made all this possible by uh, sharing personnel and reagents and uh, inspiration. And uh, basically, in surgery in particular, a lab only goes as far as the support behind it, because you all know what we do. And it's very tough to uh, uh, have that work uh, without a machine behind you. Um, so within our group, the, the Brown Lab, I gave it a long name, but it's kind of hard to say, so I'm just going to call it the Brown Lab, but then Lisa Brown will take credit for it. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to thank, so Dr. Galante, who's uh, our intellectual collaborator in driving a lot of uh, some of the questions that we ask. Uh, Jim Becker, who I pirated from uh, Dr. Farmer for uh, part-time anyways, uh, who's put in a lot of work, and Chris Pavetti, who basically runs that entire space and is just... Uh, he, he basically is the boss uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, we have some undergrads who are coming in and learning, one back there. There's Nicholas in the back. And, uh, and then a couple of other undergrads that we're getting up to speed and getting ready to have them crank out a lot of work for us. Um, a lot of members of the Farmer Lab have also helped with preparation of some of the uh, specimens that we have or ordering or procuring the reagents that we needed. Uh, and so I've listed some there, uh, Taryn and 
and Karen and, 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 and Robert to some extent. Um, and then administratively, uh, Chancey Sweeney, I'd like to thank. And then, you know, going down the road, we have a lot of, uh, so mentorship uh, is also critical for survival. And so I'd like to thank Dr. Greenhall and Dr. Cho, both presently and in advance, because we're going to do big things. Um, and then just a couple pictures. The deadlift picture is included because apparently my lab is obsessed with weightlifting and they ask everybody who comes through basically how much they bench and it's a big thing. So anyway, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Sorry. Well, Ian, you never uh, failed to disappoint. Really. It's spectacular to have you remind us. I think the most important take home to me was what's here and what's here. Yeah. And these are the things we can't lose no matter what. No matter how much we complain about something here or there, what we do is a privilege every day and the <coughs> chance to, to take the big picture, the small picture, and back again. It's just the most extraordinary way to live your life forever. So thank you. <laughs> well, really. Thank you very much. A quarter of a century ago, my father said to me there are two you know, great um, sort of unanswered questions in, in medicine. And they were the, the mind and neuroscience and immunology. He followed that up by saying that he didn't think I was smart enough for eating. <laughs> so I'm glad we have people like right. you not right. who can take that immunology piece forward because it is complex. And I just want to congratulate you for what I think is taking really complex topics and, and helping make them understandable to all of us. And that is a gift that you should make sure you continue to expand as you go forward. Oh, so thank you. Really a special, a special thing. So questions, and I'm going to get out of the way. Yeah. Jim, um, when you talk about adding hemorrhagic shock to the model, the, was there a fluid resuscitation strategy that went along with it? And does the fluid resuscitation strategy influence the results? So that's interesting. So um, we haven't applied that to this model just yet. Uh, when I used to do the sequel ligation and puncture model, however, we would give the mice back. Uh, it's another shock model, obviously, and it definitely uh, would improve survival. Um, so what we haven't done is correlate the microvascular uh, thrombosis part in the sequel ligation puncture model, but we're looking to do that. And you could show basically sort of in that or in, or in this model itself that by giving fluid or different kinds of fluid, we could either use blood or we could use uh, crystalloid to see basically how that uh, impacts the uh, clot deposition. Sure. Well, um, oh, thank you. So actually, that's a, that's a very interesting question. It, and in part, has something to do with why I chose a pulmonary contusion model, because it's a little bit simpler. You can separate that. The shock that I saw in sequel ligation and puncture models is uh, significantly more profound um, than we see here. And there's a lot of signaling that goes on when you involve the gut. Um, because not only do you have, well, you have uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns from the bacteria of the floor of the gut, and then you also have any, the, any kind of injury will have the damage associated molecular patterns that you see. So basically when the, the innate immunity recognizes parts of destroyed cells like RNA, DNA out of context, it gets alarmed by that and upregulates it. But when it sees that in context with also pathogen repeating motifs, uh, that will actually increase the inflammation that you see. Um, and so the pulmonary contusion model is a little bit cleaner, so it's a little bit, you're able to separate it out a little bit to some extent and 
we will going forward look at that. Um, but that's that's a very complex question. Uh, I I think you still see in shock the formation of of, uh, of clot deposition in the in the organs, so it can be present in both uh, situations, and so it probably follows a similar uh, pattern actually. Dr. Fan, I'm gonna go. Yeah, our model right now is modulated so that the mortality is zero over the period that we are doing our examination. So we think it's an early event, so we're most interested in zero to six hours. Um, and over that time period, and probably over the duration, the injury is significant, but not severe enough to kill the mice. They tend to bounce back from it. Now, a more severe model, um, well, let's just say the way that the mice work, you can't have much more of a lethal, of a, of a higher energy injury without it being completely lethal almost instantaneously. This is like the edge. And so the only other way to do it is to use a different model, like CEQ ligation puncture or maybe some sort of uh, muscle injury or a burn model or something like that. But once you do that, it's like I said, there's probably not only a qualitative uh, problem with the amount of tissue injury you have, but a I mean, a quantitative model, but there's also a qualitative condition, too. So when you start injuring other tissues, uh, it, you can't compare apples and oranges. And so you'd have to do, work that out in that specific model. What was the second part? Is clot good or bad? I think of clot like I think of sepsis, right? So the septic... Uh, response didn't evolve just to kill you, right? There's something to it that is there to help you out. It's just that, uh, you know, once you get to the edge of what benefit it could provide, it probably becomes maladaptive. But it was probably there on purpose. Um, similarly, clot is probably the same. And that's the sort of the argument that I was saying about the, uh, the coagulopathy of trauma. Like, why would you evolve to have that response? Like, it, it would, you don't evolve to die, right? So there's some utility to it, potentially, or, you know, that maybe is a little bit beyond our understanding right now. But it could be there to keep you from clotting in distal areas, and hopefully you can control the local area where the hemorrhage was most a problem. Because if the vasculature is intact someplace else, then the bleeding should manifest only in the areas where you have the direct injury to the vasculature. And maybe you could contain that if you hope to survive. Uh. Absolutely. Right. So yeah, so that was one of the things we were thinking about. So naturally, we tend to anticoagulate patients after trauma. In fact, like, so you don't get PEs often by just sitting on your couch, but doing the same amount of sitting in the setting of trauma, all of a sudden you get the PEs or the DVTs, right? Um, because you have an increased propensity. So there is potentially something behind it because you know we are able to give prophylactic treatment with heparin and prevent some of this and we've always been looking sort of at the microvascular or the macrovascular level uh, with the heparin but the what is happening in the microvasculature is is not completely investigated in a thorough way so um, we can actually apply heparin within our model. We can downscale it and we can show uh, how the uh, deposition of clot it actually reacts when the heparin is actually on board. We can see over the time course how that affects the evolution. And that's something that we're actually planning on doing down the road. Yes? Yeah, the renal, um, the, the, the renal injury is probably going to take some time to occur. And so by, to titrate to renal injury, we probably need, um, there's a couple things that we have to take into consideration. We have to take into consideration the dynamics of the deposition of the clot, like 
over what course it happens and how long it, it stops and what time course is interest or what time point is actually interesting to us. And then, um, like I said, uh, we've already got it probably going as fast as we can because if we injure it more with the pulmonary contusion model, it, it'll just be dead and like right away. And so to some extent we'll have to see what it gives us and then we can sort of back down and we can look at the dynamics of the clot formation and study exactly what you're talking about. Yes, Doc. Thank you. Yeah, right, you see maybe a brief mobilization, but a very quick attenuation, yeah. That is a possibility. In fact, I think that at the time uh, when a lot of this was first being looked at, there were the two camps basically that A, that it wasn't, it was no longer getting made, and B, that it was just disappearing too fast. And I don't know where the jury ended up uh, on that. I think it's still kind of an ongoing discussion. But yeah, that's definitely a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Salcedo. Well, you know, I've been working on my explosiveness and my calf, so, yeah, <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> All right, thank you.